Hello, I'm Tim Harris. This is Julie Harris, and this is Real Estate Coaching Radio. That's right. So make sure that you hit the subscribe button so you won't miss any future episodes. Thanks again for popping by. Hit that like button, and don't forget to leave your comments and questions so we can get right back with you. We will. Thank you for continuing to make our podcast, Real Estate Coaching Radio, the number one listened to podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. And let us know what you think about this video. Leave your comments below. Thank you. Welcome back. We are on to day two and we're picking up where we left off yesterday and we're talking about how to make money with new construction. If you didn't listen to yesterday's uh, points, make sure you go back and listen. And I know a lot of you will find, uh, by the way, the show we did uh, prior to yesterday's, the day before, will also be, I think, a very big eye-opener for many of you with regards to the different types of mortgage financing that's out there. But without any further delay, Julie, let's just roll right back in and let's talk about the easiest, the most advanced ways that agents can work in new construction. That's right. So we're going to start with something 100% of you can do to get your feet wet with new construction. And then we'll end with the most advanced iteration of making money with new builds. So point number one, work in a new construction model home during the hours the builder doesn't have coverage. Sell their product when you can and keep the leads who don't build with that builder or don't build it at all. They might buy new construction, for example. Think listing leads, new construction buyer leads, et cetera. And in fact, Tim, I, don't, I think you know this, we have several of our coaching clients who have worked out deals with even some of the bigger builders. I know one of our coaching clients in Texas has a deal worked out with KB Homes, which by you know all means is kind of a production builder. They've got tons of different neighborhoods. Well, when one of them is about to be done and the next one is just starting, they don't always have the same coverage, especially if it's in a different part of town. Coverage being that um, the there's not enough new build reps to go around to all the model homes that they have available. That's right. Or maybe the hours that they work, it doesn't work all the time. There Maybe there's just one day a week that you can do this. But anyway, our coaching client worked out a deal where she makes a certain percent if she sells one of their new builds. So she's basically acting like as a sub for the new build reps when the new build reps can't or, you know, for whatever reason, uh, don't want to be at that particular, uh, that particular new build model. Now, it's important, though, to, under yes. to explain this, why the new build mm -hmm. rep want to do this. Mm -hmm. Because they're going to get paid regardless of who brings the buyer. Correct. So they don't care. They don't and, care. And new build reps, especially using Julie's example, KB, they're not going to be listing resales. They're only selling the product that that builder has for sale in that particular subdivision. Most of the new build reps aren't even allowed to sell cross subdivisions. If there's five KB Homes developments and, you know, I'm thinking of uh, Keith Moulton and his great uh, EXP group and Inkeny, Iowa and all that whole, you know, big area of Iowa where they are, they're all those large new build constructor guys. They list the mid tier ones and they list them within their uh, EXP group. But the upper tier ones, the really large national ones, it's exactly like what Julie and I are describing. So what Julie's saying with point number one is, again, get off your duffs, get away from your keyboard, and go out and befriend the new build reps, and then offer to basically be their sub working in the models. They are going to say yes, provided they you know they respect you and they know that you'll represent them well. They might have to get asked for permission, but in a lot of cases they won't. Um, and you will, guess what, sell new construction, but you're also going to pick off some resale leads. In other words, someone's going to walk in, they're going to want to uh, build with that builder, and they're going to have a house to sell, you're going to get that lead. So, And why is it that the new build, build reps aren't licensed? It's very obvious. The new builder pays them a salary, pays them a commission, doesn't want their, uh, their loyalties divided, but also doesn't want that new build rep to then start, well, this model is not good for you at you know mm -hmm. XYZ Homes. I'm going to take you across the street and sell you one from ABC Homes. They want that particular staff member only selling that particular product. That's where you can come in, point number two. Well, that's right. And let me just point out why this is number one. Remember, we're going from easiest to most advanced. Notice that here you are not asking for a listing agreement. You are not, I mean, you can write the buyer side, which they're already prepared to pay. All you really have to do is learn a little bit about their product and how a builder contract works, which is generally more simple than your normal contract. Actually, even simpler than that, Julie, because what you just said is going to intimidate about 90% of them if you think about Maybe. what you just yeah. said, right? Even simpler. Just be the meter and greeter and the please fill out your information. Or, and you turn know, it over, right? And that's it. You and could. then turn over the lead. Don't even do anything other than meet them and greet them because guess what? You met that buyer when they walked into that <laughs> model. True. You're going to get sold, uh, the, the commission. Walk, let them walk through the model. Let them walk through other, several models, maybe some specs. As long as they've registered, when those people, if those people mm -hmm. decide to, uh, you know, build with that particular builder, you will, you will get paid whatever the co-op commission is. So open your eyes to how easy this can be for all of you. That's something a very low-skilled new agent can easily pull off. 
I, I think of new construction model homes as kind of like the best buyer mousetrap ever. If buyers are searching, and we know for a fact with lower inventory, buyers are going to the, these new builds on their own. They're finding the inventory. You might as well be the one between them and the house, right? I mean, we're going to belabor this point too long, but this is something else. It's very rare that you see a new build rep that has an assistant. So if somebody walks in um, and they want to see a spec that's maybe 10 minutes away in the subdivision, that means they lock the door to that model home, mm -hmm. which means any subsequent buyers that pull up which may have been equally as motivated, are going to get, you know, they're going to leave and they're going to go next door. They're going to maybe even leave the whole area. You guys yep. get the point. So what the new build rep wants to do is sell more new construction. What you can do is cover them when they're not there, maybe just act as their assistant on the weekends, and you will pick up sales that way. We've had lots of coaching clients uh, do this over the years. I will say a funny story. I remember this. Um, we had a coaching client that would go to this new build rep, uh, this new build model area where the where it was a, I think it was a gal actually. Mm -hmm. And she knew this builder uh, rep only worked on like Saturdays. Right. And she knew that, guess what? Most of the buyers were coming out on Sundays and they never were there Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. So what did she do? She went out and made camp basically. Go where the buyers are. And then she just waited for the buyers to pull up. And then she was selling the new build reps models. And she was obviously pulling off other business from that. I mean, talk about a great, a very ambitious a uh, very yes. proactive lead generator. Which, by the way, didn't cost you a referral fee or a you know impression fee or any other kind of paying for your leads fee. And you didn't have to make a TikTok video to get the sale. Not even that. <laughs> okay. Imagine if you will. All right. Point number two, how do you make money with new construction? Create a relationship with those new build reps and or the sales managers at different projects where they refer the resale listings to you. Now, if they are licensed, and remember, they it's aren't always. It's very, very rare, uh, only if they're really, really small builders that you'll find a new yep. build rep that is licensed. But we just belabored this point exhaustively, I think. We, that was all, we rolled that anyway, into point Anyway, if one. they happen to be licensed, you can pay them a referral fee. If not, you can do gift cards and other things. Okay. Well, but the flip side to it is, is a lot of times, and you and I did this when we sold real estate, mm -hmm. we've coached our other agents to do this as well. Yep. Let's say you do go to one of those small or, or mid-level builders and there's, it's frankly, usually the person that's the build rep is the, uh, the wife or the husband of the actual builder, right? Mm -hmm. And so what you can do, as opposed to having any sort of financial exchange Change, what they're going to want to do is they're going to want to thank you for selling that particular house and by giving you the listing on their next spec. And that's something you can do mostly in the really high end. So if you approach a builder that's uh, specking on a really high end build and, and they're still out there, plenty of them, and you're going to say, well, I have a potential buyer or buyers for this property. In the past, when I've worked with other high end builders, the arrangement we've had is I help them sell this particular house to one of my buyers. And then when they build another spec that they'll list that house with me. So then obviously I can help them sell that property as well. And you'll be surprised how that domino of buyer to, buyer to listing, buyer to listing, buyer to listing, that can last you your entire real estate career. Yeah, it's a beautiful relationship. And you can have more than one with more than, you know, different builders, right? Yep. So that kind of leads us into that third point, list the spec homes. Now we've been throwing around that term, what is a spec home? A spec home, spec stands for speculation and they come in two flavors. One is the builder is building a home that does not have a contract on it yet, speculating that they will. That's why it's called a spec home. And the other way a spec home happens is if somebody was in contract to build with that builder, but for some reason, Either they backed out, they lost their financing, they lost their will to sell. Somehow the deal came apart and it becomes an inventory home. Now, Sometimes they're called inventory homes instead of spec homes. We're going to share with you guys now, like in normal price range stuff, it, in normal price range, let's say even nowadays, what the hell is normal price range, right? A million or less. Yeah. Generally speaking, it's very easy to get out of uh, new build uh, contracts because the builder knows they've got 100 buyers to that one particular house. But the more expensive stuff when you're starting into multi-million dollar spec homes, what happens a lot of times is the builder will ask for the buyer to, in, in essence, have 20% hard money into the house. In other words, let's say the buyer is buying a $5 million house and the builder is going to ask for, and usually two deposits, a million dollars. And if the bill, if the buyer doesn't close, that a million dollars stays with the builder, you see? So these are just different little things you're going to learn as you uh, climb the ladder. We've had coaching clients, we coach agents to sell new construction, all different price ranges. So you need everywhere from, you know, big old ranches and land, raw land, trees, forests, um, all the way, obviously, to ultra luxury homes. So all these skills are applicable to all markets and all price ranges, which leads me to a friendly reminder. Uh, the notes for today's podcast 
are down in the section below. So if you scroll down under the video, if you're watching on YouTube or if you're over on U uh, on iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify, just go down there and open up the show description. You'll see all the notes as Julie and I are presenting them for the most part. Mm -hmm. And you're also going to see a link to join Premier Coaching. Now, Premier Coaching is, from what we understand, the nation's number one selling coaching program for real estate professionals. And the best part is, I think all of you will agree, is you can join Premier Coaching right now for free. It's a next natural step for all of you in your real estate careers. You, We know you love this podcast. It's the number one listened to daily podcast for real estate professionals in the United States. You won't believe what you get uh, as part of a co being a coaching client. This is training. At the best we can do in the 20 or 30 minutes we have you every day, it's training. Coaching is what you get when you join Premier Coaching. So click the link below or you can go to premiercoaching.com or of course you can text the word Premier to 47372. But remember when texting message and data rates may apply. That is going to be your homework from this podcast and every podcast after that. Next point, Julie. Point number four, list every listing the builder has representing them on the whole development or the whole building if it's a condo building, for example. This may include both lots to sell to other builders and or the actual homes or condos being built. That's where you you have the relationship with the builder. So I'm thinking about people like Lance and Karen Kenmore out in Washington State who have been coaching clients for a long time. They have multiple builders, different developments where they represent the entire thing. So they have signs on lots. They can sell those to other builders. They have signs on uh, lots that they're representing the builder. It's not built yet. They have half-built homes. They have spec homes. They have everything. One of their builders is going to do a townhome project next, so they can do different products as well. So another little idea of spinning off Julie's point number four is if you, for example, have the opportunity to list a parcel of land, a big swath of land that might be great for a developer, there are people that do the development, developing. There are people that go and, and essentially have, if necessary, the zoning work done. They'll put in the sewers, the electric, the, they'll even, you know, subdivide all the lots and all the rest of it. And then they sell those off to builders. A lot of times, some of these uh, land developers, all they'll do is identify the lands and they'll sell some of the land to somebody to develop the land all on up, on up. So what you're going to discover is from a big old farm field to new construction and a big, huge subdivision, there are different levels of businesses that are involved. Now, how do you stay involved if you're the one that happens to cross the big old soybean field, <laughs> as was the case for Julie and I sold real estate? All right, so you find the big parcel, let's call it you know, 25, 50, 100 acres, whatever it is. You then will list the property, and then you will then find the people in that particular market that do the development. And then the developer, you if the lots are then sold as a whole, off to a new builder, which is usually how it actually works. Try to stay attached to the transaction every single deal, every time the, uh, the property changes hands. Make it so that you're part of the deal every step of the way. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. There's a friend of, Jill, of Julie and I's in uh, Houston. His name is Vinod. Mm -hmm. He owns a place called Urban Living. And in its day, it was a massive brokerage. And what he would do is he goes out and identifies well, he would find a parcel of land in Houston, the zoning laws, and this is, you guys are going to think I'm making it up, but it's true. <laughs> yep. In Houston, you can actually have a commercial building right by a residential building. And so it's not uncommon when you're driving around certain areas of Houston where you see like, how the hell is there a church's chicken right next to a, for example, uh, you know, this uh, literal home. And, you know, next, uh, next to some to condos, a condo building, yeah. next to a car wash. I mean, sure. that it, you drive down urban living. It looks wacky, but there it is. That's what no zoning looks like. Yeah. Well, right. I think he didn't he specialize in opportunity zones and stuff well, like that. Well, well, that's what it originally was, but right. it, it, it didn't. And then he was revitalizing. And, and stuff. over time, it wasn't so yeah. much of an opportunity zone because everything became really nice. But what he would do is he would find these parcels and then he had a team. He would put the land in contract. Maybe it was an old building or it doesn't matter what it was. And he would put it in contract. And then he actually had a team of architects that would go in there and land developers that would go in there and do all the prep work, including doing the elevations and the floor plans and the rest of it. And then he had a handful of builders, six or eight different condo builders or developers, wherever they wanted to call themselves. And then he would sell it on up. So he was making money at every single step of the way. And then ultimately his real estate brokerage listed the condos. You guys get it? You can do similar things. That is a way to make I, I mean, I'm not going to, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Let's just leave it at yeah, that. Yeah, well, I mean, you bring up a good point because I don't think that many agents realize, uh, you know, when you're in the day-to-day -day agent world, you're thinking buyer side or seller side. I'm going to make a listing commission. I'm going to represent a buyer. But when you think about new construction, go back to the beginning. 
all new construction started as a piece of land. That got sold. That got sold to a builder, maybe to a developer, and on and on and on, to your point. We're not suggesting you learn other people's businesses. What we're suggesting is you get to know the people that are in the other businesses so that you then feel comfortable. You might get a call out right now. Someone's texting you to come list some big old farm that they just inherited, which is in a prime area. You go out and list that farm, and you're thinking, well, I guess I'm just going to list a 25-acre farm. Exactly. You're missing the real value of that opportunity. It's not just getting one measly commission on one measly 25-acre parcel sale. You are then going to sell it to a developer. You're going to bring the different developers to explore it. Then you could possibly sell it to you know a big uh, homes uh, a builder, you, a builder, and on up, on up, and up. So you've got to think big. One listing, all one listing. Remember the key word here, not buyer. One listing always, if you work it, it can equal five, six, ten transactions, or as many of you are learning, you can actually develop. Okay, here's another example. Sure. Frederick Eklund. Okay. Yes. Perfect who we've had example. on our podcast mm -hmm. and we're friends with. So Frederick what did exactly this with uh, apartments in um, you Manhattan. know apartment developments yeah. in Manhattan, right? Mm -hmm. And all the, that's that's this is the normal same cycle idea thing. just with a building. You can build entire business. Heath Moulton. Here's a better, more salient mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. Heath Moulton's out in Iowa, mm -hmm. and we talked about him a second ago. But he did exactly what we're saying, not for the big KB you know, homes guys, but yep. for those mid-level builders that were mm -hmm. competing with the KB homes guys. Mm -hmm. And he did everything we're just describing. And the, I think last year they sold, if I remember correctly, I believe they sold three or 400 new construction homes. It's amazing. Right? right? He got the listings yeah. on all of them. And he was yes. working, I think, with two or three different builders. See, that is that is one of the unique things about new construction is it, it is scalable, right? The things that you learn with one project, you can take to other builders in other parts of town, price ranges, different types of products. So point number five was to sell as much as you can yourself in those situations, ideally also to your own buyers, because you generated the buyers since you had the listings controlling more of the project and keeping the builders happy as possible for future developments. Then what you just talked about, point number six, bring the builder or developer land, sell them the land, list the new homes, sell those homes, lather, rinse, repeat. And finally, but uh, most assuredly, number seven, develop the land yourself or with investors. Now this may include house by house teardowns, rehabs, fix and flips, or larger projects like bringing the land and doing the whole development. So to learn how to execute any or all of these methods, again, this is not coaching. This is training. We're exposing you to ideas. Coaching is about how to do those ideas. Here's the thing that's going to surprise most of you because it certainly surprised me when Julie and I figured this out. Builders know how to do one thing, build. Builders are going to build no matter what. Now, if it's the low interest rates and lots of buyers and let's say it's a low interest or low buyer uh, market, that's what they're going to build. If it's a luxury, you know, a demand for you know, very expensive homes, that's what they're going to build. No matter what the interest rates are, no matter what the economic situation is, if the, bar, if the builders can find money and they can find land, they're going to build. You've got to have that in the back of your mind. And uh, let's give them another example. Sure. So there was this area that where Julie and I sold real estate in uh, central Ohio, where it was the zip code was, I think it was 43235. I don't remember. It, it only sort of matters. Mm -hmm. But what this was, was this area of that was surrounded by um, expensive property tax areas. And right. there, and there was these, yeah. uh, they were called patio homes. So there's these small homes. I mean, not really small to be honest, 3000 square feet or less, but built to a very high standard, super fancy. They were houses that were designed for people that were selling out of big homes mm -hmm. to downsize to. They're basically zero lot lines. They weren't attached, but they're, you know, might as well have been there just stacked right on top of each other. Super cute houses, very well built, very nice amenities, just really, really nice Nice places. areas of town that happen to have lower taxes. So these are perfect for like empty nester types. Exactly. And by the way, um, that was the builder Roman Alien Hughes mostly. They're still doing that. They're still finding like micro parcels. This is the point I'm trying to make. Yes. So when you are thinking, when you again, when you're looking for listings, you might find a 1950s or 60s ranch that is just, let's just be honest, best to be, you know, made it with a backhoe. In other words, the house is nothing. And maybe it's an expired, but you now are smart. You're now realizing that is on one acre, two acres, three acres, five acres. And you now know that in that much acreage, it, one acre, uh, let's say three acres, realistically, if there's zero lot line houses and the footprint of the houses are relatively small, that could be 20 or 25 different houses. And it's already zoned residential. Exactly. That's how you got to start thinking. 
because then you're going to start seeing the reality that opportunity is everywhere. So those properties in this area that we were talking about would silently be sold to developers. Mm -hmm. So they, they, you know, in your neighborhood, your communities, you probably have stuff like this. Houses that were built back in the 50s, the 60s, and 70s, but they have these unusually large lots because, again, the time was different. Land wasn't worth as much. People had this preference for larger parcels or whatever. Evidently, everyone liked to be sitting on a, you know, a <laughs> lawnmower more. every weekend. Yeah. Exactly. All right. So that the times have changed. People's expectations have changed. So when you come across the listing, even though your modern real estate brain is telling you nobody's ever going to buy that, that needs too much work, blah, 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 blah. It's not in the good school district. It's right next to the school. But good. you got to start thinking outside of the box in a market like this, in an economy like this, in a housing inventory situation market like this. And you will start realizing that there's more opportunity based on what you know and your willingness to actually apply that knowledge. Knowledge equals confidence. Ignorance equals fear. And you remember back on the real estate test when we had to know highest and best use? Yeah. You know, and how many listings are out there? I, I get the, you know, I see this on our coaching sessions sometimes. You're right. As a, quote, normal agent thinking would be, oh my gosh, you know, I'm happy to have this listing. It was built in 1965. They thought it was, you know, rehabbed, but it was rehabbed in 1975. Not so much. This is going to be really hard to sell. All the feedback is it needs to be knocked over. Or I can't deal with the wallpaper or this, that, and the other. Well, you're thinking about it the wrong way. Maybe the highest and best use of a listing like that is to turn it into something else. Let's give them some more creative ideas. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of small condo uh, developments. Uh, Julie and I own some exactly. Oh, well, let's just use Law 5 as an example. Sure. All right. So when um, back yeah, in. That is a good example. Actually. Yeah, it is. Before the housing crash, there was these, this condo development that was made in Las Vegas called Law 5. And these Law 5 condos were really, really cool. You guys can Google them. Um, and very modern and just really high-end everything. And, and But they were super expensive. Um, some of the most expensive real estate, and this is in Las Vegas, and these were starting at 500 grand and some of them were closing around 750 grand. Well, long story short, a lot of them were selling to out-of-town investors and flippers and you guys know what happened next. 2007 rolls around and the whole subdivision basically is taken back and sold off by the FDIC. 300 units. 300 units. Now, those 300 units were owned by the FDIC and then eventually they were bought by um, actually a, a gal that Starwood? sold some tech company out of no, LA. Right. She's, she's a big investor and she bought right. all of them. Starwood owned it in the interim though. Yeah. Starwood owned it after the FDIC, but this all this detail doesn't matter. All right. So now what does she have? She has very high end condos. Julie and I own some of them in there that we bought out of foreclosure and we bought uh, from auctions, but she owns a vast majority of these that were built to a very high standard that when she sprinkles them for sale, she's putting them for sale for five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars and they're selling relatively quick. Uh, now, here's the, the reason I'm telling you this story. There are a lot of apartments, air quoting here, that were originally intended and already zoned and already deeded to be condos that you guys could be taking the listings of that aren't even being thought of by residential agents as potential condo developments or redevelopments as the case is, mm -hmm. as the term is actually, that you could then be, lo oh, look at this in the commercial book. Here's a 10 family. And look, these are already, these are clearly could be made in, you know, condo eyes. Then you dig a little deeper and you find out they're originally condos that then got converted to rentals for reasons I explained. And there's a flip side to it. You might find a building, and this happens a lot in LA, that was always apartments. Mm -hmm. New York that, too. Right, exactly. Those always apartments that would be perfect for condos. This is called conversions. Right. So you could find a condo, existing apartment building or whatever, and you could convert those to condos. Now, I'm not suggesting you do this work yourself. Matter of fact, you shouldn't. But I am suggesting is you be the person that brings that opportunity to these builders. And then they're going to, they know that business. They have the contacts. They know how much things are going to cost. Mm -hmm. They're going to put pen to paper. They're going to basically be the ones liable for the debt. They're the ones that are going to get the loans. You guys get it? You get the listings. You then get the upstream business and the downstream business from the resales. Uh, when those people put those condos for sale, uh, you know, you know, five years from now, you you guys get the point. This is how you have to think in a market that's so inventory constrained. Well, and the, those thoughts will serve you well your entire career. For it's sure. It's just that now you have to have those thoughts to do the volume that you want to do. And I, I always think what a blessing it is to be able to make your living in real estate doing those types of things without actually having to be out of pocket yourself. What the point? You don't have to buy these projects yourself. You don't have to develop it. You can partner with investors. You can just be on the sales side. 
There's so many opportunities. That's why we get so excited whenever we present new construction things. Drill down on that though. Don't bounce off yeah. that. Okay. If you were to open any other kind of business, you're going to have to have fixed costs, a lot of which is going to be the to, uh, for the cost of your inventory of what you're trying to sell. And not, I mean, think about it, right? You want to open a furniture business, you want to open up an appliance business, you want to open an art gallery, you're going to have fixed costs that are associated with that. Real estate, and there's a few, even if you want to open up a business where it's a, uh, a you know, a car lot and all the cars are consignment cars, you're still going to have associated costs with that. Uh, you know, all these types of things. In real estate, you can go list a property. You're going to make up to whatever the total commission is, many markets, 6 or 7%, when that thing sells. And your associated costs with uh, acquiring and maintaining that inventory that you will margin by 6 or 7% is zip. There are no other businesses that are like that. And nobody recognizes that. People don't talk about that. That's the reason why real estate is so profitable if you're not spending all of your money on silliness. And I'm speaking of silliness, you and I came across a NAR report that we're going to talk about on Friday. Yes. Um, guys, get this. So you guys know that Julie and I beat the drum for proactive lead generation versus passive lead generation. And frankly, one of the biggest black holes of spending is always marketing, branding, social media, YouTube, all the rest of it, right? You listen to this podcast. Now, here's your proof. Less than 7% of all Realtors, members of the National Association of Realtors, less than 7% are 39, I know, 30, I'm sorry, 7% are 39 years or younger. I think I said that right. I think that's right. So basically nobody's 39 years or younger. In other words, those people that are, uh, that are going to be attracted to the more social media marketing stuff is a vast minority of all the real estate agents out there, which is also a vast majority of all, or minority of all the buyers out there. The average agent, and sellers for that matter, the average agent is a 60-year-old uh, white lady who's been in the business for, I forget how many years. I think it was 16, something like that. A long that. time. Yeah. And here's the magic part. She gets a majority of her business from centers of influence and past clients. Yep. That is the reason that Julie and I always were, are always hammered down on the first thing you learn is centers of influence and past clients marketing. But here's what I really thought was interesting. Sure. And we're going to, again, we'll do a podcast on this. If you look like, so for example, the percent of business that comes from centers of influence and past clients, it, it, it like by between, you know, year zero, when you first get your license to year four, it like quadruples. And by the time you've been in the business three or four years, Essentially, it starts to uh, approach 50 to 60% of mm. all your business comes from centers of influence and past clients on average of all the realtors that were polled. That's the reason, again, Julie and I want you focused on the proactive uh, lead generation. And don't get you know pulled away into the bright light and be a moth that's going to get zapped by the bug light of the newest, greatest shiny object that comes around. There will always be shiny objects, but follow in the path of the people that have been in the business for a long time that frankly are making a majority of the money in a market like this and keep your eyes open to the realities. There is opportunity everywhere for you. If you're not discovering it, as we've been hopefully exposing you on this little podcast series, if you're not constantly feeling overly, like almost bouncing off the walls, optimistic, because you know you're in the right market, you know you're in the right industry, and you know you're in the right market, in the right industry at the right time. If you don't feel like that, you got to ask yourself why. Julie and I just, you know, we talked for 30 minutes, just, you know, and we were giving you all the ways you can create inventory. How do you feel? Are you feeling excited? Maybe you're feeling a little overwhelmed. I understand. But what you should be realizing is there is no lack of inventory. There's no lack of opportunity. There's no lack of people who always want to buy and sell real estate. But there, what it, there is a lack of are agents that are willing to take the right actions and do the real work of real estate. If you're willing to do the real work of real estate in this or any other market, you will make a fortune. And I'll even go as far as to say it's I'm, I don't like using the word easier, but I'll use it just to make a point succinctly. It's easier to make money now if you're doing the real work of real estate because you will have virtually no competition because if um, you know 99% of all agents have only been in the business since really 2007, 2008, and they've never really had to learn to think, let alone take the actions like what you guys are learning on this podcast, let alone our coaching program. When you are willing to do the real work of real estate and be proactive with your lead generation, be a furiously fast with your lead follow-up, actually be a professional, I promise you, you're going to be overwhelmed with opportunity. I'm laughing because um, one of our coaches, Brandon, just texted me. Brandon Remember, Jackson. Brandon just texted me. He did one of the live sessions, our coaching sessions. He was sharing a quick story. To your point, anybody who is being proactive today is getting rewarded at a higher level than ever before. Than ever before, because they have no competition. Because they have virtually no competition, okay? <laughs> 
coaching clients I'm speaking to you. Okay, so Ryan from last week. Remember Ryan? I think he's part of our EXP group. Yeah. Okay, so Ryan goes door knocking. Remember our door knocking series like two weeks ago? Okay, he takes that to heart. Brandon's doing a great job, um, you know, on his coaching calls with him. So Ryan goes door knocking, hits uh, one door, does a follow-up, and the owner of that house said, well, I'm not ready to list for about three months. Talk to me about that, but my mom has a house to sell. Why don't you go over and talk to her? House is 1.9 million. That's one door knock, two listings, the one three months from now, and the mom's house for nearly $2 million. Go Ryan. Proactive. Matt He's Will, door knocking. Matt Wilhall, in my coaching call with him mm-hmm. last week, and I know you're listening, Matt. I'm going to have him on the podcast. Yes. He t- he basically told me how he had a chain of six closings uh-huh. that happened. Oh, Matt, I please forgive me. I don't remember what the ori- the origin the genesis was. I think it was him. I think I remember. He was door knocking, looking for a house for one of his buyers in a neighborhood in which the buyer wanted to live. That is what it was. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure anyway. <laughs> anyway, that he did discover a seller that wanted to sell. The buyer wanted to buy the house. And from that, he generated six other transactions. There you go. Because he was being proactive. Right. And you guys, the, if you don't see that, if you don't feel what we're saying, if you're not like vibing with, you know, to use a term that I learned from Zoe yesterday, <laughs> if, if you're not vibing with us and you're feeling like there's a lack, or if you're feeling there's scarcity, if you're feeling scared, if you're feeling like even like, oh my gosh, real estate's not for me. It's just because you're listening and you're listening to the wrong things and you're taking either no actions or the wrong actions. I, Which I don't know is how all fixable, to say but that's fixable. Right. Exactly. Don't be stuck. Don't think that's how it's supposed to be. And don't wait for the market to change. If you're dependent on the market giving you your business, you probably are going to starve. If it's meant to be, it's up to me. And by all the story, the reason that we highlight coaching clients is to show you that that's just like you. Yes. Okay. You can do it too, but you have to be proactive. That's right. So guys, thank you for keeping this number one listen to daily podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. Um, please do consider joining Premier Coaching. It's the next natural step for all of you. In the meantime, have a fantastic day. We'll talk with you on the show tomorrow. Hello. Thank you for having watched this video. Please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's right. And don't forget to hit that like button, leave your comments and questions below, and we will get right back with you. Thank you for watching this video. Remember to watch the next one. You're going to love that one.